All right. Welcome back, pole vault coaches and athletes. Uh, this is part two of our pole vault coaching series tonight. Um, and we are um, grateful to have Coach Tim Riley joining us from the Northwest Pole Vault Club in Seattle, Washington. He's going to be speaking about youth development, how to start them and how to fix them. So uh, Coach Riley has great ideas here, tips and tricks for us to uh, get those pole vaulters off the ground right away. Uh, and get them started. So I'm going to pass it over to Coach uh, here and let him take the, the reins. Please, those of you out on YouTube, uh, share your questions in the live stream. Those of you on Zoom, share your questions in the chat, and uh, we'll bring those up as we as we get time here uh, tonight. So thank you again, Coach uh, Riley, for joining us, and it is all yours. Thanks, Joel. And greetings, everybody. Um, uh, thanks again for previous presenters. Um, I uh, continue to get rich from uh, this kind of collaboration. And, and in truth, my entire pole vaulting career, which started with some unprovoked uh, obsession with pole vaulting as a fourth grader, was utterly uninformed. I never knew what I was doing through grade school, through high school, uh, into a first year of college. I didn't have a coach that was knowledgeable. I never had correct polls. So I ultimately retired from trying to vault. And as I became a teacher, I started trying to coach other people how to do it. And I still didn't really know what I was doing until I met this man here 35 years ago. I was so delighted to see him at the Texas Relays. This is Carl Erickson. He was a, a Baylor legend. He did a camp up in Seattle and I was reading everything I could find, watching every video I could find. But when I saw his camp come up and I went there, I had a brain blast. I, I uh, a, a gigantic epiphany about how wrongly I've been teaching, especially beginners, how to pull vault from the start. He showed me that my expectations for a first year boy or whatever to get to 10 or 11 feet was disastrous. And uh, so he, he, he changed everything about my uh, expectations and in, in my teaching. And I would say and I, the following summer, uh, after I started a new good athlete who had immense success, who became a two-time state champion, I followed him around his camp circuit for the following summer and just kept sponging in more and more and more and bless his heart for uh, uh, tolerating me all summer. When I came back, the things that started happening at, at my place were so profoundly different from anything anybody around me had seen for a very long time. Since like Casey Kerrigan, we had one other 16 footer in 25 years, right? So um, they said, man, you, what's going on? And, and so I, I ran my first camp thinking, no one's gonna come, but I'm sure glad to share what I've learned. And, and it became, uh, that was 31 years ago, it became kind of the only one of its kind in, in Washington. Um, so for 30 years, maybe 250 kids and 30 coaches would come every year to my camps, uh, mostly Washingtonians, but some outliers. And then 15 years ago, I was uh, tapped to consider whether or not we should have a coach certification program in Washington. And I, I, I thought that would be a good idea, so long as it was primarily oriented to safety. And so the coaches could get kids all off the ground with some basic fundamentals that whether they went high or not, they would all be safe. Because in my 35 years, no one has ever had a more serious injury than a sprained ankle. And I'm really proud to say that. I knock on wood each time I do, because I know things can happen. But Carl got this started, and I, I bet there's nobody who's been more influential. Uh, you know, Some might say that my work has been, but really I, I would still be lost if I hadn't first known Carl. I had other great mentors too. I spent a week with Rick Addig, and he completely changed the way I coached the approach and so on. But I just want to be specific and, and remind folks that uh, I'm always uh, happy to say that I stand on everybody's shoulders that came before me and I continue to unapologetically steal from everybody that I can uh, steal from. So now my, uh, my PowerPoint is not moving on me, so I'm gonna go stop share and bring it up again if I can. I guess you should figure out one thing for sure, and that's that stuff isn't going to work, right? Hmm. All right. 
Try that one more time, Coach, down there in the bottom right. I'm going to go. I'm going to go this way. Go current slide. Well, that's not even working. There we go. Okay. Well, so as as uh, Jim said a couple of days ago, uh, he has maxims that that are like the uh, the hallmarks of his program and and what i have uh, is four that that are integral to the coach certification program that we have that coaches must attend every three years and that is first you know everything that we're about to talk about is to get kids landing safely in the pit if they ever go high or not they're going to be safe so long as this happens so first um, I'm going to skip ahead here to my, to my, my first, first is the approach. I don't need to repeat what expert, uh, college coaches have already said about the approach, except for one thing that for me, something that is so essential that I, I just, I'm, I'm harping on it all the time is I want this to be a mechanically efficient, consistent approach which sounds like this. If I don't have that fast moment at the takeout zone, if I have something even steady, I don't want it. And if I ever have a kind of a stressed out start that elongates into takeoff, nobody even needs to watch that ball. It's going to be a disaster. So paramount, and, and I would say pyramidically, that is the most important building block on the rest of this. So if something else is weird and needs uh, attention, in an early vault, including that, that's what I focus on first. I think that uh, uh, efficiency, maximum controllable speed, and a stride pattern that can arrive within a few inches of that takeoff point every time. Uh, and then I would show videos to uh, my coaches, and I'm not going to do that right now. I'm going to skip through some of that stuff right now like this and get I have examples of a slow rhythm um at the end and then a, a correct one so i'm going to skip over some of these videos and get to what i consider to be the second most important thing that become <clears throat> foundational for beginning pole vaulters that is that the pole carry drop and plant needs to happen just so we can't willy-nilly do it or trust it to be right we want um the pole drop to begin well, back up a step. We want to carry the pole weightlessly, as Todd just demonstrated. And we want the pole drop to begin at step three, like Todd. I count backwards, uh, take off foot strikes only. So I have a three left run or a four left run or a five. I start all my be beginning athletes with a three left run. Speaking of right-handed vaulters. So the pole drop begins at three. The pole plant begins at two, the next to last takeoff foot. And the plant begins with the tip down at eye level. So um, beginners are apt to, for example, try to plant way up high like this. You can't initiate a plant from up there. I'm just going to say a couple of things that are not mentioned. I want the pole tip down about to here before we initiate before we initiate the planning action. I don't want it up here. I don't want them to bring the pole down by bringing this hand up. And I don't want them to try to, to carry the pole down low. I want it to be high level to initiate. And then top hand travels up the body line, bottom wrist stays above elbow. That means this does not happen right before plant. I want this to stay, as Todd said, like a fulcrum, and I want the top hand to go up, bottom hand to go up as high as we can, albeit with a really tiny pole at first, so the plant angle is going to be pretty steep like that on a beginner. These are some drills I'm not going to pause and show you right now. I uh, don't think uh, they are needed. I will come back to them. If, uh, if, uh, the third foundation is a springy takeoff. Uh, the question was asked of Todd Late, do kids run into their vault or do they jump into their vault? My answer is jump into it. 
And of course, we want the takeoff to be negotiated with minimal loss of velocity, right? So a person can over can overemphasize the jumping aspect, but I don't have very many who do. I am more apt to have kids who underemphasize the jumping element of the vault, and so I want that to be uh, to become second nature for them. I build this from the sandbox to the runway, or since I'm operating in an indoor facility, I do it on the turf before I do it on the runway. It may require me to keep their speed down at first because I don't want them to go so fast they can't jump or to go so fast they can't plant. <clears throat> and I want a sharp punching knee drive to accommodate the sharp punching down strike below the hip. These are the vaults that I would show or the, the drills that I would show my attending coaches in our um, The fourth foundation is that we want the athlete to learn to <clears throat> jump into the vault with a long, firm, upright body into flight. This creates the elasticity that not only moves the pole well before the swing, but sets up the athlete in a stretched posture so that the swing can be a power producing, power increasing reflex. So this means that we're leading with chest and knee drive, not with hips. And our long firm trail leg will lag behind us, our extended top hand will drag behind the head and chest, and our bottom arm, I say, must push firmly and must also not be locked. Uh, I might have said when I had Carl Erickson's slide up here that the thing that blew my mind with Carl Erickson was that he said to me, you have to teach a kid to bend the pole on the first day. Now, I know that most coaches would say that that's pole bending is not pole vaulting, and, and you're right. Um, but because of his influence, I have always been a strong bottom arm advocate and I know that I have to always caution that from becoming a block bottom arm obstacle. But as you'll see with my beginners, it's one of the hallmarks I think of, of my beginning program that gets my kids going so high, so fast. There's Laura Marty, she's an all American uh, senior in that picture. Um, here's a sixth grader in the picture <coughs> on the right that had only had a couple of days with me. Uh, I'm not going to show these drills just yet. What I'm going to show you instead um, <clears throat> is that uh, what, what I mean by this ex extended, firm, sort of gymnastically tight, um, stretched out body, what it looks like in world class athletes, what it looks like in, oh, there's a lot of this picture that everybody's found that. Um, a University of Washington vaulter here, Diamara, and one of my old. Uh, uh, kids have trained with me part-time here in high school and All-American. And then here it is again. I hope that you can see the similarities. These two kids here pictured are in their very first practice session with me. They'd never touched the pole before these days. Uh, if kids come to me who uh, don't get that, you can see how loose this body is, the, uh, the slack in her system here. Um, I try to tense it up, to firm it up and get her more... Uh, uh, chest oriented and knee drive oriented and a little less lethargic on the pole. Here, I just tried to create a little space for this gal. In truth, that's not a very good top hand. Uh, so I, I would not, I would not um, aim for that posture. So here, about my four maxims. <clears throat> if I let a kid start and I don't insist that it's fastidiously correct, I'm gonna have problems for a long time. My favorite athlete to coach is one that comes to me before they've ever pole vaulted at all. Second, each of these four maxims are not hardwired natural things to do. And in fact, each is counterintuitive. So for example, if I just handed a kid a pole and I said, hey, welcome, 
here's a little pull for you. You can see the pit here. Let's give it a try. Come on down the runway. They would not do any of those four things. Okay. They would carry the pole with tension. <coughs> they would slow down before takeoff. They would not jump, but they would hang low and they would not push hands high. They would, they would pull guaranteed. And I tell the kids, when you when you when we start here none of the things i'm going to ask you to do are going to be easy but because i'm going to go slow with you i'm going to insist each one is correct before i give you the next the next drill i also believe that you can't learn new motor movements at full speed that when we're going all out red line and our eyeballs are big we're going to do what we are most habitually trained to do and so that that not only uh, suggest to you that I'm starting my athletes slow on day one, but it should suggest to you that a chunk of my practice for everybody every day uh, starts like with Todd. I say, what are we working on today, Susie? And uh, we come to an agreement about that. And she's going to do that work from four or five steps before I say, you know what? We're an hour into it. Let's get back and go big. Uh, because that's where the, that's where the changing and the shaping of motor movements takes place. When I'm on a long run, I can work on my long run, but I'm not very likely going to change the way I'm moving on a pole. So I build a practice routine for perfect drill repetition, repetitions. And uh, so I, I should just mention that. Um, I'll, I'll mention it later. Uh, the last thing that I want to say is that, especially with young pole vaulters, Fear is always a little bit of a, of a dynamic in progress. And fear always manifests itself in a slight contraction of the body that I can see from beside the runway. So if I see a, a, a kid who otherwise been jumping well and suddenly is, is pulling a little bit with the top hand, or suddenly I see a little back tilt and a heel strike at the takeoff point, any manifestation of breaks, I have to bring him over and I say, talk to me about that. I noticed that your safety governor is a little bit freaked out. What happened that made you uh, cautious on that jump? And they might go, well, I don't know. I said, well, um, maybe as Todd said, I'll, 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 we'll count that as a, as a accident. But if I see it twice, you got to tell me what's going on. Did I raise your grip and you're not like that? Do you want to go down a pole? Uh, do you want to just remember to breathe a little bit before you start your run and not be so tight. We got to do something to turn down the amplitude or we can't get the work done that we're going to do. And, and if we don't learn to pay attention to that threshold of comfort, we don't get good work done. We got to be pushing the envelope, but it's very clear to me after seeing so many thousands of pole boulders when that, when that cautious dynamic shows itself again. And I know that I have to turn down the amplitude to progress. So here's the four phase teaching sequence that I'm going to share with you guys today. It's what I would do to every pole vaulter that comes in here for the very first time and has never jumped before. First, I'm going to take out my phone and I'm going to show them the sequence of drills that you guys are about to see. In fact, uh, even a few more. I'm going to say, here's what we're going to do, Fred. A, I'm going to have you do this. B, here's what it's going to look like. C, here's, here's how the day is going to go. After about a half an hour, we're going to move to this, and then we're going to do that. So they've seen it all already. Then I'm going to start with uh, a platform step off, and I'm going to warn them against pulling down with their arms or pulling up with their legs. Here's what it looks like. If I'm outside or, uh, you know, if I was at the Dempsey Center in Seattle, I would have them stand elevated on a plyo box or a cart or something and step off like this. The reason I elevate them is because I don't want them to have to jump up to get their feet off the ground. I want them to feel what it feels like to stretch and hang primarily from the top hand and to feel this tension in their body throughout like that. I might even, if they, if they just can't do it, I'm going to leave them on the platform back about here. And I'm going to say, don't leave the platform. I'm holding your pole. I want you to lean out into it and feel yourself uh, stretching on it. So you know what elongation feels like. Okay, so that's the first drill. 
And if I'm not in a sand pit, I do it here, which is how I do it in my gym. I don't want any swinging or pulling. Classically, I'm going to see this on the left is the eight out of 10 athletes do this the first time I invite them to do this drill. You can see the top arm is pulling and the trail legs are sucking up. There's a little bit of an abdominal crunch that goes on with it, a kind of a tension in the midsection that I always see. And until I get them more freely stretched out like this, it's not going to work. Okay. So as soon as they've repeated that a number of times and I've shown them videos of nope, 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 look at your trail leg. And then I finally get, yeah, yeah, what? Five in a row. Now we're going to go to the second thing. And we're going to go walking on the turf. That might have been Susie's fifth or sixth one, you know. First walking could be just like super, super gentle. Uh, <clears throat> then I'm going to film her straight on because classically, I don't know if anybody's going to see me here. Yeah, you'll see me in the top corner, won't you? Yeah. Okay. So classically, kids are doing this. They're going to do something like this almost inevitably the pole is going to be like you know not vertical and if they leave the ground they're going to kind of drift a little bit to the right so i want to be sure that what they're doing is dead straight so i want i want to uh, put this on straight on angle like this to be sure that they can see themselves going straight next i want to make sure that they're not building an a-frame which means you know they're not tilting into a pole this way that's bound to go down before it ever goes up. We gotta we gotta be sure that their inclination is to is to jump as straight up as possible. And that was a correction I made with Mandy here uh, on her first day. She was kind of diving at it like that. As soon as the walking on the turf seems kind of comfortable, and I try to animate it a little bit as they are comfortable, I say, can you can you give it a little more juice? Uh, and as soon as it, it looks like it's comfortable for them, and I've maybe raised their grip a fist or so, by the way, I didn't say this already. If I'm starving a person on day one, I say, reach as high as you can, reach as high as you can, you know, as high as you can reach. And then I'd say, let's just get a go up about that much higher for your first walking plant on the turf. I want your feet to have to leave the ground, but not by much. And then within, uh, within 15 minutes, they'll be holding about a, a foot higher than that. So um, we're going to go to this wicket drill. I set out five wickets, three feet apart. And to do this, they have to get into a little bit of a jog. Three. One. Notice that she's still carrying the pole on her ear. She's just, we're not carrying the pole down at the hip yet. I just want to let her walk, 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 and punch up and go. She might need 10 of these before I say, gosh, that looks smooth. I'm going to give you a, a change. I'm going to ask you to carry your pole to the side. And then I'm going to come up to her and I'm just going to, you know, here you are holding your pole. And I'll just stand next to her and move her hands down by her hip, you know, until I get a posture that I like, like this. And I say, now, as you get ready to jump, we're, here's how we're going from here up. You know, we're not going to. No, 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 we're not hooking that thing. We're going to keep it as close to you as you can. Try to almost brush your temple on the way up and straight up we go. Can you do that? And, you know, I let it fly. I don't say when to do it. I just say, bring the pull up in time. And this is what I get. That was her first one carrying it from the side. And it was about right. Maybe it was a hair late, but it's about right. I start counting out loud and then I say to them, are you paying attention to my counting? Can you tell what I'm counting? And usually they say, I, I hear you counting. I don't know what you're counting. And I say, okay, well, I'm counting the, the left foot strikes on the floor. Three, two, one. One means jump. Two means initiate your plan. After this 
is looking smooth and comfortable and the grip is perhaps eight inches higher than the, than the high standing grip. Then I add an element that's it's been pretty transformative to my teaching um, sequence, which is speed. Remember, uh, I don't just want a mechanically efficient run that's running over wickets. I want to run that sounds like that. So the way I get that on the first lesson in the first day as I tell them I'm going to use my phone, I'm going to, I'm going to use my stopwatch. I'm going to hit start when your left foot strikes three, and I'm going to hit stop when your left foot hits one or the takeoff strike. And I'm just going to show you the time. It's probably going to be about 140. Okay. It doesn't matter what the time is the first time, but what does matter is in subsequent tries, can you speed it up and go 130? 125, 118, can you do that? And every time they go, I hold up the clock and they're like, faster. So here's what it looks like. We're aiming for under one second. Here's what I mean by that, in case I'm confusing anybody. Okay. Um, first of all, if I can see, I would almost have to get way back. I believe it's about 3, 2, 1. The first time it's not so fast. Three, two, one, get faster. Three, two, one. This is not how fast you're going that way. It's how fast you can couple the footwork and the handwork together. So here's what it starts to look like after I've given her the prompt to go faster, to get more. Faster. Now she's hauling ass and her grip is too low, but I like that she's just like going at it and she feels what it means to quicken into her takeoff. So now I'm going to move her. Oh, here's another example of what this looks like. This is an unusually tall, nice candidate to start vaulting, but this is his first day of speed wicket. Three, two, one. And it's not, again, how fast he's going. It's that from three to two is not as fast as from two to one. Okay, so here we go over to the runway. I set him over here, and uh, the first thing, of course, I, I want to uh, correct her pole carry. She's a little all tweaked to try to keep her pole straight. Uh, I should say another thing. I, I guess I skipped over. Uh, and you can see with the runway there, when athletes first do this um, wicket drill, chances are their pole plan is, is, is going to move like this. And what I ask them to do is to imagine they're vaulting on a narrow corridor, like Susie's standing on my runway right now, in such a way that if you're inside your house, could you pole vault without scratching the paint? Could you keep that end of the pole and this end of the pole from hitting the wall? That means keep it in a narrow tunnel or corridor. Uh, if I can keep, that's why Susie came over here so determined to make sure her pole was not and of course, I don't care that the start of the pole carry is off to the side like that, but I want her planting activity to stay narrow. So uh, when she first moves to the runway, I'm bringing the wickets over to the runway with me. I'm going to bring the first two. The reason I do that is because as a person comes over to the live runway, that is amplitude. That is arousal that's going to stress them out a little bit because they haven't done it before. And when I see... Uh, when I know that they're going to encounter a little more stress, where that's going to show up is in the first two strides of their run. If I don't bring the wickets over, the first time an athlete goes to the plant box, it's going to be like that. Here in freaking Pete. So I don't want that. And I'm bringing the wickets over to make sure that they start kind of big. And then they'll be so close to the pit that they're going to, we're going to have to compress a little bit to make their jump work. Uh, I didn't say this. Chances are 28 to 30 feet is about the space that you would uh, that you would go to. I, you know, I've just done it a whole lot. So I can tell within six inches where I'm going to put somebody the first time. If you can't even imagine, uh, and you've got a typical freshman athlete on the first of March, probably 28 to 30 feet, maybe a 27 for a little girl, is going to get it done. And the wickets go. If I was on a, a 28 foot start, I would take a little cone and I would set it at 28 feet for them. Then I would put a wicket at 26 
and a wicket at 22. So they've got a two, a two foot reach and a four foot reach to start the rhythm of the run. And this is what Susie's very first run on the runway looked like that day. Really not terrible, I don't think. Uh, not great. She's already got a knack for jumping up a little bit. I'm, I, it's critically important that I preserve this elongated body here like this with the knee drive up. She's leading with her chest. She's almost leading too much with her chest, but who's got that problem ordinarily? So I'm, I'm not gonna like wash that and tell her not to. I am gonna start moving her grip up inch by inch as she goes here. And a few things accelerate progress. Um, each time she goes, she's trusted and goes a little faster. So naturally, I'm gonna kick the cone back six inches at a time. And then I'm gonna kick both wickets back six inches at a time to keep following her. But by the time she's come out from about 28 feet to 31 feet, um, I might suggest to her that it's time to step off the runway for a little, for a little uh, break. Uh, I know that new motor learning can be accelerated by a periodical pause. That's called a period of reminiscence. Um, I'll come over and I'll let her plant the PVC pole. I'll let her jump up into the high bar, and then I'll bring her back to the runway and watch for improvements. Here's what I mean by the PVC. I want, this is going to surprise and maybe piss off some of you people who have been doing this. Have. I want, hmm. I want Susie to learn right away that she doesn't have to hug her pole. She doesn't have to, to uh, Todd demonstrated a, a, a nice graphic of the, of the, of the classic plan a kid's going to choose for themselves if, if they're left without provocation. I, I don't want a pole banging against the kid's chest on the first day or ever. And I don't want them to have to tilt their head to the left to avoid being hit in the forehead. So I want some space. I want a little bit of space to develop between the athlete and the pole right now, day one. A little space to put them on. And so Susie can kind of push on the PVC a little bit and feel some flexion there. She's inclined to preserve that space. I will add also at this time that this would be impossible if I had Susie on an even weight pole. She's 5'9", she weighs 125, and I have her on a 10'6", 100 for this opening day. I'll, I'll justify that further as I show you some more of what happens. This is a, a drill that I would do to let a beginning kid feel uh, jumping into a firm, stretched out body rather than a kind of a floppy one. This girl came to me after pole vaulting for a year and she never had a firm straight body into takeoff. She, she, that, that fourth foundation was never even mentioned to her. So each time she left the ground, her hips flew forward and, and her legs uh, wrinkled up beneath her and, and of course she was on terribly small poles and couldn't swing either. So I adjusted my drill with a bungee across the bottom uh, just, just so she could feel a little bit of what it means to be, you know, stretched out and long. Um, anyway, okay. <clears throat> so I bring Susie back and and you'll start to see just a little bit of space between Susie and her pole here. Again, grip is a little too small, but it's it's keeping, you know, she's actually a little outside here. It's keeping her confident. But now I still have from shoulders down, I've got perfection. What I need to get going on is a little higher grip and a little hand higher over the head like this. And we're probably about an hour and 20 minutes into this first lesson of hers. And so I still have time to do it. And if that was a stiff pole, it would just be kicking her butt and, and 
frustrating or it's not. It's, it's, it's a very easy pull. Uh, in fact, she's probably pushing too hard on it right there. I'll show you as, it, as I move her grip up. Now that it's pretty smooth from three, uh, I ask her permission to give her more space to run faster. And if she gives me big scary eyes, I say, oh, we can wait a little bit. But she was like, no, cool, let's go for it. And so I moved the wickets for her probably back about 11 feet. And I, and I take the wickets as well. With each attempt, stronger and faster wins a slightly higher grip. The process is accelerated exponentially if the athlete's pull is light. The other day I was talking about this with Joe Block and he said, whoa, 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 man. Like how light, how small are the poles you have for high school kids? Said, yeah, well, really small. I've got a nine foot 85, a 10 foot 90, a 10 foot 100, and, and I kind of go up like that. So um, because I have almost entirely high school kids and, and a lot of them start with me for their first time, sometimes a sixth or seventh grader, I, w I don't want them to be holding on to 11 foot 130 pound pole if there are 130 pound kid has never touched one. And I'll emphasize again, trying to bend this pole is not the goal. Learning to rotate the pole is, and if the pole is lighter, it's less intimidating, it, it fosters confidence, and I get way faster action, way faster progress in my team with little poles than I do with even weight poles. So here's Susie's initial four step run. It's a little wobbly. See if I can get her at the takeoff moment here. You see that? She's got a nice long body, but she's almost getting whacked in the chest with the pull. So I love all of this. It looks good. I don't like having the elbow a foot in front of the, uh, it's almost at the tip of her nose is out in front of the pole too. That's, that's, that's no good for me. I won't have it. So here's what it looks like in about another 15 minutes. Okay, so now she's not quite off the ground. Nope, too far. Come on, baby. Now I have what I consider to be world class in every way except the size of her pole and the, and the velocity with which she's coming at it. She's not blocking, but she's pre preserving space between herself and her, and her pole. And she's getting this completely elastic, stretched out body into the jump. And she's coming at it with confidence. I don't see any heel striking or breaking at all. And so that's what I'm aiming for in my first lesson. And I get it a lot. Here's a reminder that walking around the front of your pit and filming kids straight on can reveal a lot. Um, some athletes, without knowing it, kind of run around their pole a little bit on the first day because the pole's a little intimidating. It's just a kind of a natural instinct to get around the obstacle rather than to push through it. And we want to push poles, not go around them. <clears throat> and here are some other kids I have. I've just saved a whole bunch of uh, first day videos. Um, this is a, a freshman, very small girl, although she'd been a gymnast, her first day at a four step. That pole is even smaller than the one that Susie was on. I just want to show you why I do what I do with little poles. Check that out. It, it's just awesome, in my opinion. And she's preserving a little space. I didn't uh, mention this with Susie, uh, but sometimes I ask them to put a yellow wristband, sweatband on their left hand or their <coughs> bottom hand so that they can keep track of it. I don't want it to go behind their head like this. I want them to be able to see that thing out in front of them. Eyes up, wristband in front of me. Okay. And if she was to start pushing out farther, I would not allow it. I don't want her to push so far that I lose this integrity here. I want that stretched up body. So here comes my next athlete, Gunner, first day. Here's my next one. This is a sixth grader. 
fellow sixth grader, was a national champion eighth grader, and has jumped 12-8 already this year, although she doesn't get to finish. We're going after Mia's record, but look at that first day. That's a pretty big deal for me. If I can get that on day one, <clears throat> I've got an athlete on my hands. <clears throat> Here's a great big old decathlete um, who came to vault for the first day, and this is what his takeoff was. He's a little docile in the uh, legs here, but what happened to my... You can see the same kind of, oh, a little ahead of myself here, the same beautiful stretched out body with, with firm, uh, tight torso and knee drive, and he's maintaining space between himself. And he's a 175 pound guy, and I had him on my 11 4 160. A little small for him, of course, but keeping it small for my beginners, I believe is what facilitates rapid progress. Here's uh, just another very recent first timer from Four Steps. Come on, Zoe, what are we going to do with you? Oh, uh, this is where it happened last time, huh, Joel? Yeah. Um, do I have to go to a skate? Yeah, I have to. All right, I'm going to start it again here. Maybe it'll work. Come on, baby. Yeah. All right. This is what we're looking for. This is what the poster on the wall, I got right behind them there, I have a poster of, of Eliza McCartney. Eliza McCartney. Oh, nuts. This is my last example. This girl was uh, my second most prodigious first time starter ever. And she got back to five steps on her very first two hours. Here's what her five looks like. Let's get her in the takeoff moment. Boy, you know the other good thing I saw here? Your mom asked me like, what do you think, coach? I said, what do I think? Hmm. I think she has no brake pedal. This girl has the sweetest absence of caution instinct that I've had in the gym for a really long time. Um, and she has uh, now, uh, she was the seventh grader right here. And I said to her mother, I think she could be the best eighth grader in the UFA next year. That's what I think, if she, you know. If she's into this, if she likes it. And she not only was that, she won uh, indoor and outdoor freshman gold last year. So she made 13 feet as a freshman. I know that it's not widely accepted that it's appropriate to bend poles early. And so I thought that, you know, what I could offer coaches today was what I do for beginners to. Uh, to, to get them through a two-hour sequence that encourages the quickening takeoff, the jump instinct, the high hands, and the tense, firm, stretched out body is facilitated by light poles. And uh, I think the thing to do is to, uh, is to uh, pause here and see, how's my time, Joel? Yeah, yeah, pause, should we pause and see if there's any questions so far and I can do some more things if there aren't or whatever. <clears throat> Yeah, absolutely. So um, a couple questions. I know that you have um, acknowledged this a couple times, but and it's uh, something that we talked about a little bit um, earlier this week, you know, considering the, the if I'm a high school coach and the, the, the rules of uh, the confines of the rules of the, the weight and the pull, um, are there still things that I can adapt from your system here that can that you feel will help me get athletes started. Yeah. Are you asking me if I would say to a coach, Oh, I am a rogue rule breaker, but <laughs> you should follow the rules. Here's what I say about that. I've been doing this for 35 years and I have coached 10,000 or more different kids. And I've never had one more seriously injured than a sprained ankle. And I have watched coaches with kids, crashing around the front of the pit at the state meet because it's the first time they've been weighed. What we, a, a guiding principle of our safety certification that we, that we say to every coach is the highest priority you must have for your child is their safety. And that means you've got to land them safely in the center of the pit. I will never send a kid to a track meet to compete 
on an illegal pole. But you can be dang well sure that if it's my own child or yours, I'm not going to put them on a pole that makes it harder for them to land safely in the center of the pit. I say the rule was misguided in the first place, and most coaches agree with me. Um, velocity is what determines an athlete's safety and pole appropriateness, not um, the label on the pole. And uh, I say uh, it's, it's paramount to start people on gentle poles in the environment we're talking about before any competition or whatever else like that. So um, could you do it uh, if you felt bound by the legality of never, now, first of all, a, a kid is never to compete on a, on a legal weighted pole. I don't know if anybody's ever said a kid is never to, to touch uh, a pole that is rated below their body weight. But um, I forgot what I was gonna say about that. Okay. Yeah. And we, if, if it comes back, we can, we can address it yeah. there. Um, the question, another question is oh, how often, you know what I was going to say, go ahead. <clears throat> sorry. Uh, is there, are, is there ways to teach kids to pole vault uh, without bending a, a light pole in the first day? Yeah. Check out Mondo. I, I, I was listening to his dad's presentation. He was straight pole in the backyard for a while. I, I don't have fourth grade to uh, senior high school to do that. I I'm on a, feel in a bit of a rush. Some kids only come to me as juniors who want to retire from gymnastics and get to college and vault. I'm going fast track. And so I, I would just say that you may do it other ways, but my kids are going to beat yours because they're going to progress much faster than they will if I, if I leave them on straight poles for the first six months of their lives. That's what I would say. All right. Um, first question that we have here on YouTube, um, is how often do your older athletes, your more veteran athletes, return back to this beginner series drill sequence that you, you've you shared with us? Almost never. Uh, now, those kids that I just had in here for the first day, if they came back for day two, we would go through the same process more rapidly, and I would get to the four-step run in the, run, in the runway probably – in 45 minutes rather than an hour and a half. And then maybe I would, uh, we would just work on higher grips, bigger poles. Um, maybe we'd get them to five. But not very often do I return my uh, veterans to wickets and turf planting unless it's just a part of their first moving around. A lot of them do turf jumps just in their warm up routine in my gym space here but uh, they don't very often do it over wickets. I do use wickets for my older kids, but not in the turf vaults. Uh, I do wickets in the springboard and stuff like that. All right. Um, another question here is, um, since you allow your first time athletes to bend the pole on the first day or get them to that, that part, do you ever um, go back to straight pole inversion type drills for your, your athletes later on in their development? <laughs> Yeah, one of the things that uh, almost every athlete of mine does when they first arrive after they after they do their mobilization, when they first get on the runway with the pole in their hands, it's, they're doing a few straight pole vaults. And the first thing they do, either one hand or two, is right side up. And how high can I hold for my three-step run? You know, if the first one's pretty easy, I say, sweet, jack that grip up. Can you do it? And then that means uh, they're going to jump harder and reach higher, and there's no bending for that. Sometimes I even game size it a little bit and I stand up on the pit with my tape measure and, and I measure how high above their standing grip they can hold and turn over a three-step run. And it, the rule is broken if they bend the pole at all. So um, there are benefits to straight pole drills like that. And I teach them to swing first on a straight pole for sure um, before they try to swing on a bent pole. Absolutely. And I think this question, you addressed this question a little bit when we were discussing the the poles and the weights and those things. But the question is, um, I think one of the things that needs to be emphasized here is that when you're doing these uh, beginning things, these are drills versus full full on jumps. So Absolutely. the idea yeah. of um, doing full on jumps at, on poles that are uh, below your body weight isn't a Never. goal of yours. Yeah. Never. So no. just want to 
No, I'm talking about how do I start somebody who is a brand new neophyte and I, and then we're not going to be swinging at all. We're going to be just moving poles and it's all a phase stuff. It's all pole rotation velocity development, you know, uh, and a big part of that is trusting themselves, feeling safe to bring it hot sauce style as Todd was saying. Uh, I don't have a kid that's dumb enough to bring it a hot sauce style and a pole is going to kick their ass. And, and so I, I just want them to to be comforted and to, for that growth to be facilitated by a, a pole that's not intimidating. Even if it's not bending, it, it feels better. Even kids that come and try to do some swing up drills, if I'm not very familiar with them, I say, God, put that 14 foot pole down and go get an 11 foot pole. You don't need a big log to swing on and it facilitates progress because it's just a less intimidating horse to ride even if it's not bending perfect one other thing that i know noted here um and todd talked a little bit about it in his presentation but can you tell us a little bit more about the pvc pole um size length all the, those different types of things yeah. david butler has some stuff but um, yeah, for our right. audience yeah uh, i thought i invented this thing i'd never seen this before until i said man i'm getting a flexible pole because I just, I just want kids to feel stuff that they can't necessarily feel on a live pole for a while. So I went to Home Depot and I got a few 10 foot pieces of one inch PVC and they worked great. I just put a little um, rubber pole tip on them and, and I had my kids using them uh, in, uh, in my sliding boxes. I put one sliding box against my pit so kids can, can do their plant drills there. Uh, it can be done wrong very easily. Uh, you have to watch out for that. A lot of kids grab one and they just start pulling down and bending and it's like, no, 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 no. The way that David's drill demonstrated it today on, on Todd's presentation, just keep moving in, 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 and let your hands arc behind your head a little bit. Stretch yourself out. That's how, that's how to feel it. Uh, and so I also uh, started uh, bringing in one and a half inch 10 foot pieces because they're a little sturdier and a kid can actually take a couple of Drives a little left, right, left, and strikes the thing and jump into the air a little bit, and it kind of bounces them back. So they hit the, they they hit the plant, touch down, and come right back to it. So inch to inch and a half, ten foot pieces is my answer to the plastic. Perfect. Um, I think that uh, the the other part of your presentation talks a little bit about correcting some errors. Um, you know there so yep. i think this is a good good time to maybe move into that piece uh tim okay, okay. <clears throat> so yeah the last few years uh, as coaches have come to our safety certification program like four times, you know, they've been in their 12th year now or something like that. They said, can we start, you know, could you guys bring some more juicy stuff about how you get your kids going so high, how you kind of repair problems and what you see at track meets that you, that you wish you could coach and stuff like that. So one of those that, that seems pervasive to me in high school vaulting is, is this first one here, which is long striding heel strikes into the takeoff that kill the velocity. All this beautiful fast run is just kind of like it's the tire goes flat right at the moment of takeoff. And why is that? Well, first, this is what we see. If you slow down your video and you see these things, you know, you might as well, you know, you just kill half of your runway velocity. And uh, we have to clean this up um, as a highest priority for a kid that comes to camp. Almost none of them say, can you help me uh, you know, repair my loss of velocity at takeoff. They all want to know, like, how can I swing higher? But, but the answer is almost always rooted in this. And if I want to go one step farther backward, I would say it's probably was originally rooted in fear. And it was never corrected. So even if they're no longer afraid, they're, they've programmed their bodies into this, uh, into this comfort zone of being way under to feel correct and all that kind of thing. So it can be a menacing thing to change if a kid's been doing it for three years, but change it we must. So here's what I would do. First, I explained to them that fear can be a part of this and that if I see your posture tilting back or pulling down with your top hand, 
I got to ask you, what are you afraid of? What, what could make you feel more comfortable? What can we do to free you up to go at it and to not hesitate? Second, uh, I can put them back in speed wicket so that they can remind their whole being, what does it feel like to fly through wickets? Um, um, Richie was speaking of a, quite a matrix of spacing for wickets. What I always do is I lay out 10 and I put them evenly spaced. Rick Addy shared this idea with me some years ago. If I have a, you know, a small girl like Zoe, that one of those first ones I showed you there, I might, I might set hers at four and a half feet. I might take the typical um, 11 foot female and put them around five feet. I might, you know, whatever. But all of them, all 10 are at five feet apart. So as they, as they drive into the first one, they really got to work to make them. And as they speed up and transition into tall body, those wickets will come pretty fast for them. The answer is it gets them into the rhythm that I want and lets them feel like they're coming out of a slingshot at the end. So then I might also apply the stopwatch to the live runway. So while I do that three, two, one with my watch, the wickets, I might remind them like, you know, I'm bringing out my watch again. Can you keep it under a second from three, two, one? And if they have the stopwatch, or now I actually have tree lap timers I place in the last seven meters of the run, that data feedback motivates them to haul ass into their takeoff because they quickly turned over and they want to know what the time was and if they if they turned it into something faster. I also like the sliding box drill for distance. By distance, I mean measured run into a sliding box, measure the distance between the takeoff point and the flight before landing. If a person takes off at 10 and lands at six, they did something to kill their velocity. It's a terrible jump into the vault. If they can take off at 10 and float all the way past the zero, there are minimal, if any, impediments to their takeoff velocity. They, they can heal those hesitations over there. Um, so here's, uh, I'll, I'll just shoot through some of these drills. You've already seen that one. I don't need to see that again. Here's a sliding box for distance. Five, four, three, two, three. Here is wickets to a springboard. Five, four, three, two, one. <clears throat> Start the approach over wickets. Sometimes the reason that the approach is flaccid or disappointing at the end is because the start is too tight. And so if you just remind them, that uh, we need to breathe big, get tall, and start with some power over the first two wickets. Uh, I don't know what happened to that. Oh, here it comes. <clears throat> it enables them to make the takeoff more climactically fast. Big, 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 and let them go. <clears throat> go, Maggie, go. Uh, I also use a takeoff roll which I call a bumper now. If a person is, can be pictured at takeoff, like this boy is here. No, 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 no. What happened? Hmm. If a person can be pictured in this posture at takeoff, it's not necessarily enough to say, we well, got to move your step back. You're taking off inside all the time. Sometimes they're getting there as a big, long last step. I, on my runway, I have a hash mark of 16, so I can always ask a kid who was inside or whatever, how long was your last stride? And they can look at their video and say, oh, six and a half feet. I say, yeah. So I'm going to put the bumper down. If, you're, if a kid is supposed to be at nine feet, for example, I will put the bumper at eight, six. And if their last stride is long, I'm not going to move them out at all. I'm going to move them in. I'm call, I call this compressing the run. I'm going to keep moving them in six inches at a time. And the rule is they may not step on the bumper, of course. They know that they peripherally have to keep aware that they got to get that last foot down beneath them. And um, as soon as I start hearing that, I love it. And as soon as they start feeling it, their pull is crushing and they're moving it fast. And they get this huge grin on their face because they like it because it doesn't feel good to take off like this and to get ripped off the ground. So the takeoff, uh, this is a, you could use any number of things. 
can't see mine over here. I, I have a rubber strip from uh, an Office Depot that you might place a like, three inch wide rubber thing that you would place over an electric cord so you, people don't trip on it and I just spray painted it yellow. Anything like that that you cut down. Now my kids are so used to that. If they see twice in a row they're taking off inside, they're at the back of the runway saying, coach, bumper please. And so I, I know that they want it placed down there. So this is another way that I can get them to quit that long striding at the end of their run. But you have to compress the back end of the run into the bumper to get the rhythm that you want. Um, I want them to see what the ideal takeoffs and flights look like. Boy, oh boy. If I could have everybody watch Sam Kendricks' takeoff strike and use that for the role model, it's the fastest last step beneath the hip I've seen in pole vaulting. I just love watching it. And I don't have a video of it in my presentation here. Um, <clears throat> I want them to remember what, you know, our all Americans here at home uh, look like in the air and what beginners can look like in the air. Uh, the secret sauce for beginners or to break intermediate kids habits. Smaller pole, smaller increments of change mitigate fear. So if a kid like you said, Todd comes to hit me and he's a he's on a 13 150, you know, and, and he makes 11 feet, I'm probably going to put him on a smaller pole until I until I reshape his motor movements. And then I will tell him that, the, you know, he can only do what he trusts. Um, so he gets used to that. A second thing that has become a big deal in my uh, in my gym is that I don't believe auditory learning is very effective for pole vaulters. So if I've got a kid who's doing some funky thing, pick one of 10 things. And I say, stop doing that. I can tell them 50 times, but the next time they come down to the runway, they're going to do it again. And the reason is because they have no sense for what it's supposed to feel like. So I have what I call kinesthetic stations all over my environment in here. Uh, and so if a kid's last step is too long, I'm going to send them over to the high bar to do that high bar takedown drill. Or if their plant is too passive or if their plant is hooking, I'm going to put them over on the PVC plant drill or I'm going to have them do wall plants with a stubby and they're going to do 10 close to the cheek plants before they go back to the end of the line again. If they're trying to finish their vault and they're riding the long left arm and they're never coming off of it, they're coming over to my flex in and turn drill and they're going to sit on the floor and pull on this bungee until they feel like, oh, that's what I got to do. So whenever they do that, they go to a station before they go back in line, their next vault is influenced by that activity. Conversely, whenever they stand in line and they visit, they're wasting three or four minutes time and their next one is exactly the same. So it, it not only gives them a, a kinesthetic uh, or a neuromuscular reprogramming of the, of the pathway I want, it's also elevating their consciousness. So they're like, next time they're at the back of the runway, I'm gonna do that this time. It felt good, I'm gonna do that. And it's, and it's much better than just going because it's their turn to go. Last, analytically, if some kid says to me, I'm really having trouble with my A, B, or C. If it's your B, roll back the video and look at A. Todd was astute enough to point out that if a kid's not in this beautiful stretched out position with the trail leg behind them, chances are, back up the video, they didn't jump off the ground strongly enough. And if that's the problem, chances are their last couple steps are the problem and we might even go back to the start of the run for that. Um, when rebuilding, add step swing, then bar only so long as the powerful four fundamentals are preserved. Um, whatever. I think I'm, I think I'm done there. I, 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 might, I bet I have more questions brewing there. Or <laughs> have them if I don't. Um, Maybe everybody cut it off when I said I start people on soft poles. <laughs> no. When Hoffman uh, said quack. Uh, I got a, I got a question in your club. Um, one thing that we didn't talk a lot about. That's something that's been talked about in some of the previous ones. Um, what can you tell me about your, you know, jumping bars versus bungees? Um, some of the things that you do on that end of the, of the, the, the 
pit there. Um, are you jumping a series of bars? Like, what does a practice kind of session look like? Yeah, <clears throat> it depends on the kid. If I've got a real uh, early beginner who's maybe only in their first five or ten practice sessions, they're, they're, they're probably still not looking at a bungee at all. I really want to develop a phase before a swing. Um, and uh, if, um, otherwise, I, I would say everybody's on board with no bungee for a while. Everybody's going to do their, their one-handers or their three-step swing-ups. Uh, I like to get them long. I was going to show people a tool I have. Um, I have this skinny PVC pipe here that's eight feet long. And at the end, I have one of these swimming noodles I put on it. And so I stretch this thing across my pit in the back of the pit, way across the pit, behind my safe landing zone. And I say, I want to see you swing and launch over that crossbar. I want to see you get feet over the uh, foam bungee. And it kind of, I think uh, the term that Dave Butler used was pole poppers. It's just like, get a little bend and boom, launch off the end of your pole. So there's going to be some of that before I put a bungee up at all. And then, uh, yeah, I, I keep most of my day going with bungees. And uh, I like to use bungees to stretch them a little bit. And then I like, I, I don't like just kind of leaving it at, at PR level. I find if it's a PR level, kids are staring at it. And so sometimes I, I use what's called a reacher and kids will say, can I have a reacher bar? That means like a 12 foot kid wants to get toes over 14. And sometimes if what I'm working on is, is completing a vault without staring at it and getting stuck, I might put a 12 foot vaulter's bungee at 10. That sort of takes it out of their visual field. So what I can get them to do is is to track their top hand. Now the yellow wristband goes in their right hand and I want them to see that and see themselves hips and top hand connecting together so they don't even see the bungee at all when they're passing over it. As track meets come closer, I always use a bar to rehearse the meet routine. And so I tell them that you get 30 minutes today to get ready and each of you gets opening bar, whatever your opening bar height is. And I want to see you make it three times with no misses. Um, I don't very often use hard bars in practice for like PR heights. Um, I don't do it much. You would think that my kids would get to meet and they would be freaking out, but that's not been my experience. My kids perform pretty well at meets and uh, in fact, better at meets than in practice. So. Uh, it's not been a problem for me to emphasize bungee more often. So two thirds of practice, maybe half of practice, there's a, there's a, a bungee to clear. Um, and if they're younger, maybe less often. All right. And with that same kind of theme there, um, how often are kids, you know, full jumping um, kind of, at your club during the season, or sorry, outside of the season. And then we talked a little bit about the in-season routine that goes Most on. Most of my club kids come to me twice a week, fall, winter, spring, even if they're at their spring season and, <clears throat> and they have track practice at their home schools, a number of them still come at least once a week on a Saturday or, or later in an evening on a weeknight. So long as the coaches uh, and I, have uh, this relationship that's my ideal, which is like, I'm in your corner, I'm your support guy. Uh, if your kids train with me, I'm gonna communicate with you what we're working on and what works. And if, and if they come to me on a Saturday, um, if you wanna tell me anything like, hey, help me with this, or you know, tell me what you think about that, um, that relationship goes on through the season too. Uh, but twice a week with me, if I was a spring high school coach, however, and some college coach said, I think you ought to vault twice a week. I would say to that college coach, no freaking way. I'm vaulting every single day in spring season that it's not pouring rain in Seattle. This is a complex stunt on a moving apparatus. If I'm going to beat somebody in May, I'm not going to spend any sunny day in the weight room or running laps around the track. I'm pole vaulting every darn day. And I know that it doesn't match. Any, uh, any sweet theory of the ideal, but we don't get ideal in high school, well, at least not in Seattle. And, and I've never had sun every day to even be able to say, I think we'll walk twice this week 
and and do bulk supportive sprinting on the other days with a little lifting afterwards. Um, so my encouragement to high school coaches is to vault as much as they can uh, because it's difficult to learn this thing and it takes a 10,000 repetitions. Good. I think it's important to, do you want to just clarify though what, what vaulting is? I think, I think in terms of every, when you say vault every day, I don't, I don't think you're meaning you want them to be jumping long run every day. No um, way. No, 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 no. Yeah, no. In my video that I made a few years ago, this is my uh, my best contribution to high school coaches. It's three hours of, of entirely developmental pole vaulting theory and drills. I include in there uh, on the bonus materials lesson plans for all different cycles of the spring season. What would I do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday in cycle one? What would I do in cycle two? How would I sort of tweak that? What would I do on rainy days or whatever? Um, that kind of stuff is in this video. Um, and I have samples of it, uh, in my computer. If anybody wanted to hit me up with an email or something like what, what is that? I want to see something of that. Um, which of course I welcome if people want to reach out to me, if I said something they want to disagree with or ask more about or whatever, or, uh, I also sell polls and everybody does. But I sell polls primarily to mentor people and sizing. So some dad calls and says, oh, I got to get my kid a bigger pole. What do you think? And I say, well, send me a video and tell me exactly what that boy's on. And then I'll tell you what I think. And uh, somebody else might say, hey, I got two grand. How can I, what should I buy for my starting program? Um, that kind of stuff I spend a lot of time mentoring. So I don't mind being hit on uh, for any of that kind of stuff. Um, I haven't heard any uh, college coaches say that, and they're very busy guys, I know, but but that's what I do all the time. So, um, perfect, um, Tim, and we'll we'll try to uh, get that information up up and out here in just a minute. Um, we got a couple other questions I want to get to before we uh, run out of time. Um, one of them is a question that says one of your slides mentioned something about getting stuck in the bucket. I don't know if you talked about that but one of the slides had yeah. that. And then how do you get young vaulters to finish the swing? So would you mind addressing that? Number one answer, long vaulting. Jump for the back end of the pit. You can't do that. You can't get to the back end of the pit with your feet dangling over the back edge. If you don't get your hips to the top hand and get your left arm out of the way and fly long. So that's the number one answer. And you do it with a straight pull first, and then you do it with a very easy bending pull from three steps. And then you move back to four and raise your grip a little bit and enlarge it incrementally. So if a kid can swing very well on a straight pull, but as soon as they go back to their long run on a bending pull, it all goes to crap. The reason is that they don't have these bridge drills to incrementally move from a baby three step swing up drill to a slightly bending longer drill and to keep going long, long, long until they can negotiate that entire movement with no bar and no stress about safety. Perfect. Um, and then another question is, do you use mid marks on the runway? Or... Yes, I do. <clears throat> and, are, and what what mark is that? For my high school kids, I watched their third strike. So that puts me between 30 for my poorest girls out to 30 five or six for them. And my guys are between 34 and 38. So three, three lefts out from the back of the box. Three lefts out from the, yeah. And for me, the reason that's important is because, you know, not everybody has the eyeball to pick up like, Oh my God, that kid was outside, but was it because they need to move in or because they need to run differently or what? Mostly it's too far inside. 90% of, of foul high school vaults are too far inside. But you don't want to keep moving them out if their mid mark is true. You got to get into their heads and say, you got to relax the middle of that run so that you can stick the takeoff with a little more hot sauce, feel a turn. So um, how do you so how do you know if the mid mark is true, coach? Well, when I see a run that's beautiful, I keep watching for it. And as soon as I, you know, I'm watching, here comes Allie, she's hitting 32, yeah, 32 again and I love the run, 
I say, 32 is where you belong. That was awesome. You know, maybe I've, maybe I've played with it and I put a bumper down and I've scooted her in and now I love the run. So now where's the mid mark? Yeah, 31 works for you. You know, that's where you belong. And the kids don't necessarily remember that. I have to try to keep it in my head or in my notebook that, uh, that that's where we gotta be. So yeah, if I get a kid, uh, like, you know, you get somebody juiced up in a national meet and suddenly Chloe's mid mark is hitting 35. I'm like, Ooh, Chloe, uh, are you loving your run like now? Is it feeling good to you? Uh, or do you feel like I'm a little over amped and you know, I got to relax a little bit. Cause if you love it, we got to go back a foot right now. You uh, are, are too compressed. So it just diagnostically helps me make the right adjustment to keep track of the mid mark. Um, so do you build that mid mark on the runway, um, with the pit or do you, can you build that off the runway, uh, away from the pit? My gym is only 120 feet long, wall to wall. So I'm not out of the track. If I was out of the track, I would stretch, stretch the tape measure out and I would find it on a sliding box. Yes. But okay. I don't have that luxury. <laughs> so it's a little bit more trial and error for me in this in this confined space. Yeah, the longest I can go back on my live runway is 95 feet in here, so that gets seven for all my girls, and uh, half of my boys. That's what I got. Perfect. Uh, we had a question um, here. You mentioned your DVD. Um, is there a place in which a site in which? Yeah, that these is are. Uh, this is a uh, the. Coach's Blueprint for Success series, a high school coach for each event from championship videos. That's where these are. Uh, I don't sell them myself and I don't own them, but uh, yeah, that's where they are. Perfect. Um, lots of good information there, Coach. Um, thank you so much um, for your time this evening. Um, if people want to reach out to you, um, what is the best way to find your contact information? On my website, Northwest Pole Vault. My email's in there. I'm Tim at nwpolevault.com. Perfect. Um, and uh, you said at the beginning of your video, you hold some camps. Do you still hold camps in I Washington? Do, yes, yes. There, yeah, there are always camps in the spring and summer, although we're living in funny times. I hope that the, the light goes green here in Washington soon and I can fly at it doors will blow open and we're going to be rocking and rolling i don't know to what track meet so i'm going to make up my own if we if we can't find some and do some great uh jumps in the park or on the beach but uh i will have a couple of meets in the summer and now that i, I have my own building uh, here and i don't have to ask permission from anybody my camps will get more common perfect um yeah. and and do you i'm assuming you welcome coaches to those as well yeah, absolutely. In fact, last year I said, if there's any coach in America that's sending a kid here and wants to know uh, if they are welcome, I won't charge them a darn thing if they're willing to spend the time. Uh, and uh, absolutely. Uh, I, I've never taken a check from a coach. So if, if any coaches uh, ever want to spend time with me, if their school's not paying, nobody is. So uh, <laughs> I absolutely do want coaches to come. And anytime. Even if they're just in Seattle, you know, and they're like, hey, can we come to a evening double session of yours or something and just hang out? Absolutely. Anytime. Perfect. I have one last question that just came in. Um, do you tend to adjust the pull stiffness or the grip height first? Oh, yeah. I'm a huge, big stiff pull advocate. So my kids are 30 to 40 pounds stiffer than their body weight before they're going longer. I'm glad somebody asked that. I. If it wasn't for the Kendrickses, I might feel like I'm a complete idiot. But but I've got you know I've got I, I just really like pushing stiff pulls, and and if and I also find it it's a little bit more difficult to learn great top end technique on a longer pole. And so that if I had like Chloe was a hard challenge for me. She just was a locomotive, and she was on in her very first season 13.7. 165s, capping them. And I thought, geez, she only weighs 118. Should I have her on a 14-1 or some freaking thing? And, but she didn't swing with a dang. So it was my impression, and I, I stuck with it. I got to get her top end to work before I can put her on longer poles. So 
I like to see boys jumping 15 feet on 14 foot poles rather than going longer. So the question I would uh, answer, I would have given for the previous presentation is how high are you jumping? Uh, when a kid's on a, you know, should I go to this pole or whatever? Like, you know, I, I just like to get kids on a nice stiff pole on which they can learn to vault well over their hand grip before we're worried about longer ones. That's my bias. And, I, and I'm not sure I'm right about that. I, I ask coaches all the time, do you think I'm doing the wrong thing with this kid and this pole? Um, I, I, but that's, that's where my data is. I'm getting my best outcomes, keeping them stiff. Perfect. Thank you for that. Um, and, and one of the points that I want to I want to uh, reemphasize here that you you kind of came back to at the end here is the idea of yes, you use those soft poles at the beginning to teach them good positions, but you definitely feel like they should be jumping on poles that are definitely you Absolutely. know like you said thirty to forty pounds over their body weight mm -hmm. and um, you know jumping over their top hand. Yeah, I promised you guys I was going to stay in my lane and share how I start people the very first time <laughs> I see them. This is not how I coach kids to all American medals. You know, I I'm a I'm an advocate of power though, and and I and I think that if you let a kid flop against their body for the first six months of their vaulting, guys like me have a giant pain in our rear ends trying to cure them of all that. And I found this is it's just a way to fast track, um, you know. Really great vaulting. There's a lot of kids going high here, and uh, they all started that way. Awesome. So thank you very much, Coach. Um, I'm going to ask you to unshare your screen, and then I will take over uh, just for one second before we shut down the uh, the live stream here. Um, just going to pop my screen back up there. Um, again, for the YouTube live people, um, letting you know that again tonight, this is Tim Riley from the Northwest Pole Vault Club. If you want to reach out to Tim, uh, please go to his website um, and find his contact information there. Um, and he also shared a video that you can find uh, online there. But again, Coach, thank you very much for joining us tonight and entertaining all our questions. Those of you out on YouTube, thank you very much for tuning in and um, sending in the great questions through the stream. Um, and until next time, we will see you um, here again another Friday night. Thank you.